It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Welcome to the After Show on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and we are broadcasting live and waiting to hear from you at the end of day two, the final day of the Telecom TV Summit on 6G Research and Innovation. And we're going to try and answer as many of your questions as we can, and we have already received a great selection. But it's not too late. If you haven't yet got in touch, then please do so now. There's a form on the website below this video but I would recommend that you don't leave it too late. And those questions we don't have time to answer today. We will use them later on Telecom TV as part of a follow-up article. Sustainable journalism, nothing wasted. Now, as usual, co-hosting the after show is Ray Lemaitre, editorial director here at Telecom TV. And Ray, there's already a really strong interest in the technologies and strategies that will shape what will inevitably be called 6G despite the fact that some of us still can't really access 5G. Well, that's what happens when you live in the middle of nowhere, Guy. Nothing I can do about that. I mean, I'm swamped. Swamped, I tell you, with 5G signals. Sometimes, that is. Uh, But okay, to to 6G, yes, there is a lot of interest, and rightly so. There's lots of great topics discussed during our roundtable sessions uh, and our interview with the 6G IC's Rahim Tafazoli this week. But for me, the development that really caught my eye is that of the Reconfigurable Intelligent Surface, or RIS, which looks to be a game changer in making cellular architecture way more flexible and application specific on demand. Really very interesting stuff, Guy. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And I'm sure you'll be able to buy a RIS from your own home for your, from your local IKEA store or IKEA store, complete with a Scandi name and a missing Allen key, no doubt. Those days are coming. They're not far off, I'm sure. All right, on with the show, because we've got a lot of questions to get through, and I'm delighted that many of this week's panellists have come back for more. So let me once again introduce David Boswarthik, Director of New Technologies for Etsy, Paul Crane, Network Research Director at BT, Misha Dola, who is Chair Professor, Department of Engineering at King's College London, Emil Bjornsson, who is Associate Professor at Linköping University in Sweden. Arno Parsinen, who is Professor of the 6G Flagship Project at the University of Ulu in Finland. And Javan Ofanian, Distinguished Member of Technical Staff with Bell Canada. Hello everyone, good to see you all again. Many audience questions to get through in the next 45 minutes, as we said. It's great to see this level of interest. So Ray, over to you. Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, So, Emil, uh, we're going to give our first question to you today. And that question is, how will work on 6G research affect ongoing 5G work? Is there some crossover or do you see 6G technologies as being completely separate? Uh, Emil, what do you think? I think this is a great question and that... uh, what typically happens is that before 5G arrived, everyone in telecom was working on 5G. Then when 5G is there, it sort of branches out that some people are working with how 5G will evolve over the next few years in the next release of the standards. And everything else starts to be called 6G research. Then uh, some of those things that we will develop in 6G research will actually eventually make it into 5G. So this is, for example, something that uh, I was working with Massive MIMO, which was branded as being, oh, this is the main 5G technology. And it is in 5G, but you can also use it in 4G now. And since also a lot of the uh, development is being more and more software defined, we can revise the protocols. We can make a lot of the 5G products already uh, future proof. So I, I talked with people at Ericsson the other day who were saying that Two years from now, they think that their base stations will be upgradable to run 60 eventually. So maybe the only things that is really uh, things that won't be uh, forward compatible or backward compatible will be that, well, if you need really new hardware, like going to terahertz bands, of course, you need to develop that one. But maybe 5G can support that as well in the future. So it's really more about talking about which things are revolutionary new and will be occurring like 10 years from now 
and which ones are happening now. This is the 5G versus 6G research, but everything will be evolutionary in the end. Okay, excellent. Uh, and I hope you just haven't started a race to 6G there by mentioning that uh, upgradability in just a couple of years. <laughs> Everybody will be jumping uh, on that and wanting to do the same, I'm sure. Um, any other comments from the, the rest of the panel uh, on this uh, question about uh, whether any 6G researchers? Yes, David, we'll come to you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Well, I think it's important to reinforce the, the standards works that's happening on 5G and the newly named uh, 5G Advance from 3GBP release 18 onwards. Um, that will exist. Uh, certainly we'll have 5G networks for the next 10, 15, 20 years existing in parallel to what will be named as 6G. So 5G is a very important technology. The research work on 5G Advanced, the research work on the evolution from 5G towards 6G will be hand in hand with the cutting edge research, which will eventually make up something which could be labeled as uh, 6G technology. It really is about labeling. You could say reconfigurable intelligent surfaces can be used in 5G++, 5G Advanced, or we can wait until 6G. Um, millimeter wave uh, advanced, moving up the frequency ranges, um, bringing in terahertz, maybe that we coming in later towards 6G, but it really is a question of having the timing right for when the need is there. So when the services need to be rolled out, the technologies need to be there and ready and standardized. So that's really what's going to drive the schedule for research, standardization and moving the services out to market. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, David. Okay, uh, great insights there and a great question. Um, so Guy, I think we'll move on to question number two for today. Okay, thanks, Ray. Well, our next viewer question is, what radical architectural changes do you expect to see from 6G, especially as we see that the current NGMN and academic focus is on societal goals and sustainability for the environment? Jovan, I know you do a lot of work with the NGMN, so perhaps I could uh, start by hearing your thoughts. Sure, that's a great question as well. Uh, our view of drivers uh, includes societal goals as well as market opportunities, differentiated possibilities with incentives, but also uh, feasibility and efficiency in value creation and, and, and delivery. We need to do a lot more to manage complexity and cost to be able to deliver all of those. So we have to be open to new research and innovations in terms of enablers. And at the same time, we have design goals in terms of efficiency, energy efficiency, in terms of uh, managing complexity, value creation and delivery. At the same time, uh, drivers and drivers do include societal, they do include opportunities, differentiated opportunities as well as uh, operational excellence, efficiency and feasibility. So this is not limited. Even when we talk about coverage, it takes everything to do that in, in terms of enablers, in terms of efficiency, in terms of resource and energy consumption and, 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 uh, and feasibility of service ubiquity. And also, it, it's not just a, a, a notion of, of a simple coverage. It is something that can serve the verticals. It can include new possibilities, even telepresence in a virtual physical world, which can, uh, for example, help, let's say, you know, remote care for elderly, or it can be a market opportunity for gaming, or it could be a network optimization. So we have to be open to research and innovation and new possibilities, generational change in technologies, but at the same time sensitive to the drivers as well as the design considerations such as uh, resource and energy efficiency and managing complexity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jovan. That's, uh, thanks for that answer. Um, Misha, I'm going to hand over to you because um, I'm sure you've got some views on this as well. Yes, a great answer by Jovan, really. And I uh, just want to add that, you know, what, what, what excites us most really about 
you know, the 6G architectures that it, in 5G, we really laid a lot of groundwork. We've softwareized the architectures, a little bit like introducing the operating system in a Microsoft computer, right? And it was really just the beginning of what was to come over the decades uh, thereafter. So therefore, you know, having softwareized this now gives us the opportunity really to think like a platform and therefore open it up to innovation. And who knows what architectural, you know, innovation and pioneering work can come out of this. And uh, it is really enabled with the 5G softwareization and therefore, in 6G, I think we can be much more flexible on this and, and meet all the societal goals and the KPIs, the tech KPIs we need. Yeah, thanks, Misha. So building the, the, the groundwork with, with 5G. Paul, let me come across to, to you for some more comments. Yeah, I think um, uh, you know, Misha is exactly right about the, fle the flexibility that's built in because we're going, going down that, 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 that software world and you know, extending that that softwareization further and further out into the access network, into the RAM, just gives us really interesting opportunities to to think about things in a different way. And we've got the opportunity to really, you know, test some of the basic tenants that we that we work to, basic assumptions. So, for example, you know, I'd like like to see a lot of work looking at cellless architectures. You know, you know and you know. Is that a bit? It, it, does that represent an opportunity to increase, you know, coverage, reliability in a, you know, in, in, in a cost-effective way? Uh, I think the other, the other key thing I think with the architecture is that, that, you know, what we're going to need in the future is, is well, I believe is that that smooth upgrade um, path that I was speaking about before, and so we're going to need the ability to, you know, put the right technology in the right spectrum bands at the right time to deliver the right service. And so I think that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about a radio access network. So, you know, I'm really excited to see what, you know, what, what we can actually do there to support that, um, that um, well, I think is crucial requirement for the future. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, Emil, I, I know you want to come in. Um, have, have you got a, a brief answer to this one before we move on to our next question? I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, so, so I was uh, just about to mention something about cellless architectures as well. But I, just briefly, I think it is important to keep in mind that the services of 5G, in the best case scenarios, they are probably as good as you will need them for almost all applications. It's really the variations in service quality that will be one of the issues in the future. And you know, if we should build innovative new applications that require wireless coverage everywhere of a certain quality, we need to think about how we build the hardware as well. Well, that's interesting. Thanks, thanks, Emil. Uh, OK, thanks, everyone. Uh, Ray, I'm going to hand over to you for our next question. OK, thanks, Guy. Great answers to that question. Um, uh, right, the next viewer question we have is, could 6G be the convergent technology address addressing both fixed and mobile accesses? So, uh, Paul, this sounds like one that's tailor made for you. Is 6G when we get true fixed and mobile convergence? Um, well, I'd, I'd actually hope that we um, get there before then, assuming we're talking about 6G in the 2030 um, time, plus timescales, that we could get to a fully convergent both in the core network and then the accesses, um, um, you know, way, way, way before then. And you know, five G, five G, five G architectures and the technology that's been developed around that has has is, is really enabling, is laying the the enabling framework for that. Um, there's still uh, some technology hurdles to go, some technology choices, um, you know, to be made. Um, so, for example, we really do need need a new multi path um, protocol. Uh, you know, we need one that's going to support you know, current and future traffic types, so TCP, UDP. Um, and we need one that's, you know, going to support, um, you know, policy control as well. Um, having said that, you know, the uh, 3GPP, uh, GSMA, uh, BBF, I mean, the, the architectural components for, for that fully convergent um, uh, solution, I think, I, I think are there. And I think, you know, that fully convergent solution, it's primarily a, you know, market and implementation issue. Um, if 6G is helps, you know, as a driver to 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 that realise that um, customer experience benefit, then fantastic. But hopefully, we'll get there before then. 
Okay, yes, with that 2030 timeline in mind, yes, you would hope so, that there'd be at least great advances there. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, and if there are no other takers for that particular question, then Guy, I will hand off to you for the next one. All right, thank you, Ray. Uh, next question from our audience is is one relating to our terahertz panel earlier. Um, is is terahertz capable of delivering a wide area mainstream cellular technology, or is it more an expensive replacement for in building specific niche use cases? Arno, you were speaking on our terahertz panel. What do you think to that? Yeah, it's eventually actually not more about the data rate and the use cases that are requiring really the wide data rate, large data rate and thus wide bandwidth. And then we need to go to higher and higher frequencies along with that. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see that, that uh, we need to find that evolutionary part also into technologies to get there. So how we scale up the millimeter way, what we are doing now, up to higher frequencies and gradually go to about 100 gigahertz and so forth to find really the bandwidth. So the bandwidth, if we need it, we need to, of course, bring it, the data first near, maybe it's a back hole, then going to the front hall, and then to the end user devices. There are definitely use cases and scenarios, but we may need to be more smart how we are building this system from back hall down to the user and and use the synergies along the way and really not making it a niche for some very selected use cases. In overall network, definitely a large data rate, huge amount of data will be transmitted and then we'll see where the terahertz or actually terabit per second belongs to at, at its best. So definitely one ingredient but not necessarily for all use cases, or definitely not for all use cases, but how far, how fast, that's an interesting question to be seen. Mm, thank, thanks, Arno. Another tool, but uh, definitely not a, a niche. Um, Paul, I'll come to you in a second. Um, Misha, you were on that panel as, as well, looking at terahertz. Um, any, anything to add about uh, for our, our viewer here who's looking at, you know, is it a case of either or? Is it a, is it a wide area mainstream cellular technology or niche in building applications? Well, I think we, we should give it a go. We should give it a go. And uh, I think Anna has given a great answer in saying it's really a trade-off, right? So the spectrum is much cheaper up there, uh, but of course the supporting infrastructure will be more expensive. And also, you know, the RF infrastructure of the RF devices and the mobile phones and base stations will initially also be more expensive. But uh, one of the beautiful things of telecoms is it's a, a billion people market. So once you start really pushing tech into that market, you know, prices go down very, very quickly. So therefore, you know, I would say, let's give it a go. Let's leverage really on, on the scale of the system and uh, and deployed it doesn't have to be tomorrow but hopefully you know within the next five five to ten years that will be as mainstream as a 2.4 2.5 uh, gigahertz transceiver system thanks misha and I, as you say it's a huge market we're talking about here paul i promise to come to you um extra views from you uh yeah um i think uh, you know it's one of these one of these um areas where we can take a lesson from, you know, from 5G deployment. You know, I remember the, you know, the earlier days of 5G, particularly in the US, was all, all about millimeter wave. And, you know, although there is, you know, some deployments, okay, it's, it's going to be a while before that's, um, you know, the, the, there's a real need and requirement in, you know, most geographies for, for, for that technology. Um, with, 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 with terahertz, I think we need to think about it in the same way. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, your premise is either either you know indoor or wide area cellular. I think there's a whole bunch of use cases where terahertz is potentially useful. Um, some of those, you know, cellular, you know, deployed in a mobile network. You know, others, you know, outside the domain of mobile networks. So I think I think research work is in that area is really really important. Um, you know, so point to point, point to multi point, but it's going to be line of sight. Um, and from an operator's point of view, um, you know, we, we need to deploy capacity on, you know, economic infrastructure. And 
Um, you know, so if there is a, a you know a, a demand and an economic need to deliver terahertz line of sight between um, you know access point and, and handsets or machines, then then yes. But um, I you know finally I would say I wouldn't I wouldn't make six G about terahertz. I, I think it's a it really something we should really explore and and you know research and develop see what can be done. But I think there's you know there's there's much wider issues in six G that we need to cover. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, this has really got everyone's all our panelists' interest. Um, we, we do need to get more questions in, but I'm, I, I, at the same time, I'd love to hear more of your views. So if we can get some more views in, terrific. Um, Emil, you, you uh, I think you wanted to come in as well earlier. Yeah, I'm a little bit more the skeptical kind when it comes to terahertz. Or, I mean, yeah, you can probably in the cell area get one terabit per second traffic, but not to a particular device. Uh, I can imagine use cases where you need a gigabit per second or maybe 10 gigabit per second, but one terabit, well, that would be a hundred devices for some that to share it. So for some kind of backhaul link, sure, but that would be a fixed point-to-point -point link to end users. I see it as really niche applications. I see that there are other ways of building the access schemes where you can deliver uh, one terabit per second among the users, but using multiple antenna technologies to send different streams to different users at different locations. Thank you, Emil. Uh, David, across to you. Yeah, it was just um, to stress what Paul said. Definitely, we, sh we shouldn't reduce 6G to terahertz as we did with uh, f 5G. Everybody said 5G will include millimeter wave. Of course it does, it, but it's in the later releases of 3GPP. Uh, the early releases of 5G networks being deployed around the planet didn't have any millimeter wave inside and it's been uh, rolled out slowly. So when somebody says, what do you think 6G includes? The first answer shouldn't be terahertz. Terahertz is one fundamental building block technology. Certainly money down there will be terahertz in 6g but also there will be reconfigurable intelligent surfaces there will be um, optical wireless communications there will be photonics there will be lots of other technologies so 6g is much more about the the family of technologies and the revolutionary use cases which will not exist in 5g so 6g is a lot more than just terahertz yeah, thanks, David. As, as, as you and Emil said, that's, it's, that's really keen to, to stress that. It's, it's more than just one technology. There's a whole load, um, which we're not necessarily covering in this summit, but I'm sure we will in future ones. Um, Arno, I'm going to come back to you, but I just want to get in um, Javan first. So, Javan, please. Sure. Uh, on this point, I think uh, it was very well. Uh, all the points were actually uh, uh, very valid. We have to consider the coexistence of the fact that 6G is not just terahertz, and uh, we, we also have to understand the challenges in terms of the time it takes to mature. Even with millimeter wave, it has taken time. Uh, we also have to understand, uh, you know, whether it's wide area mobility or what. But at the same time, we have to be open to possibilities. And as Misha said, give it a go. The research is valuable uh, in the future possibilities. And I'm glad to hear uh, also from distinguished academics that it's about the use case. Uh, and and how uh, when when it is needed where it is needed we all when it comes to enablement we also have to be open to the fact that so many years from now there will be new paradigms in terms of cooperation between different frequencies and the way things are delivered we do have to be sensitive to the need we do have to be sensitive uh, to the design considerations efficiency feasibility but at the same time, uh, we cannot judge it too early. We have to respect the innovations and the work that considers the considerations and the use cases and drivers we have been talking about. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks. And Arno, we started uh, this question with you, so let's come back to you for, for a, a final word on the subject. Okay, thank you. I think I agree with these cons uh, comments. And, and the most important thing is that we need to ground this a bit. The most of the research is ongoing in the frequency range of 100 to 300 gigahertz, which is in fact upper millimeter waves, as I said already in the earlier interview. So this terahertz is somehow a marketing name 
where we are heading in the long term, there is a huge amount of spectrum before that that we need to tackle with the new and existing technologies, how to make it. So in a way, it, it's a nice marketing word. There is a lot to come. There is a not, lot of research needed. But yeah, terahertz or 0.1 terahertz, there is a decade gap. We must understand that. And let's use the lower one first as we have done all, so far in all the frequencies in place. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. That question really resonated with our panel there. Uh, Ray, um, we are going to speed along to our next viewer question, so I'll hand it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Guy. And uh, yeah, I blame the media for all this use of uh, terms that get m misused a lot. Um, uh, the media is to blame for sure. OK, uh, next question here, and we're going to put this one to uh, Misha first, and, and this relates to your earlier panel. Uh, so uh, can you envision the use of brain machine interfaces that companies such as Neuralink and BrainGate are researching for 6G wireless communications as another dimension of sense? So, uh, wow, that is a, a fantastic question. Uh, Misha, any, any thoughts on that at all? I have so many thoughts. I don't, have, I don't think I've tried to answer that at all. So it's a really great question. And uh, I think the first thing to observe is that we shouldn't con, you know, confuse the you know, correlation with causality. So, you know, will, will these type of devices uh, coexist uh, with 6G technologies roughly at the same time? Will they emerge at the same time? The answer is yes. So there's clearly a correlation. Will one depend on the other? I don't think so, just as, you know, you probably have loads of IoT devices which are fairly independent of any of the uh, cellular technologies that have come along. Having said this, you know, I think it's very important to evangelize uh, device uh, markets in general. And, uh, you know, the, the computer brain interface, I think, is one of them. It, for them to really understand there's an opportunity to actually connect these devices wirelessly, whatever they do, and uh, use that immense edge uh, processing power which the telco industry offers as of late to really do things that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So I think that that, that kind of engagement process needs to needs to happen fairly early. And you know I'm excited about the tech. I have loads of you know security questions, loads of ethical questions around this. Uh, can we extend census? For sure we can do that. Um, you know, am I excited to read Wikipedia or whatever I need to do or my news morning newspapers? I just like thinking about it. That's really great. You know, could we imagine a, a human compute fabric doing some of the tasks we can't do at the computer level uh, using maybe boring some brain power? You know, I'm just looking in the future here. So we can connect things. Think of uh, 5G, 6G, 7G, what will come in the future really as a, a platform technology. And this is what it really should be. OK, excellent. I mean, it's a fascinating area. And like you say, they might not be totally connected, but bringing the two together could uh, open up some uh, incredible applications. Um, uh, okay, if we have no other thoughts on this particular question, Guy, then we can uh, move on to the next part of the program. Okay, thanks, Ray. Uh, next question in here. Uh, in a connected world where countries are at different stages of wireless implementation, rather than having Gs, generations, do we instead need a more evolutionary process? Well, David, uh, Etsy and 3GPP have done sterling work with the current generation structure, but is it time to adapt? David, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Keeps coming back. Do we need to keep playing the generation game? I think for the time being, the answer is yes. We will move towards 6G. We will probably have a 7G. And then, question mark, question mark. Uh, generations come around every 10 years. The duration seems to be getting shorter. So we're talking about 6G far earlier than we started talking about 5G back in the day. Um, so maybe the generations will get shorter. Also, possibly what we'll see are more interim steps. So now we have 5G, 5G advanced. What about if we saw additional functionality coming in with each release of standards or each, each uh, te technology generation? Doesn't need to wait 10 years. You can just bring in functionality. As we're seeing with 5G, you're going to have millimeter wave becoming more mainstream in a few years' time. So let, maybe we can phase things in quicker. You don't have to do a big upgrade. You've got software divine, defined and virtualized networks now. So you can bring in new features. You can roll them out. You can test them, roll them out 
easier. Um, um, so I think we're going to have generations for a while. I'll, I'll stop placing bets at about 7G, 8G, and we'll see where we come back. But I, I think definitely in 10 years' time, 3GBP will still be defining the, 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 the global standard for mobile networks. It may be doing it in a slightly different way. Maybe the specifications will be written in a different way. Maybe they will be automatically generated to a certain extent. Who knows? But I think generations are here to stay for at least 10 to 20 years. All right, thanks, David. I knew I should have bought that 7G.com domain name all those years ago. Lost out now, haven't I? Uh, Emil, let, let me come to you for your thoughts. So I think if you are in a low-income country, if you are going to buy a phone, probably it will support 4G already. And uh, the problem will just be that if you are going to deploy a new network there, what should you deploy? And we are coming to the point where a lot of things are already software defined. You can buy a new massive MIMO base station supporting 4G and 5G at the same time. So if you haven't deployed 3G or 4G in your country, well, maybe one should go directly to deploy this kind of 4G, 5G type of base stations. So many countries can probably jump over uh, different uh, generations. And it's really just about if you should go to upgrade the infrastructure in any way, because yeah, you can't find a 3G only phone nowadays that you can buy anymore. The, the chipsets are so cheap, so even the cheap phones are supporting 4G already. And in a few years' time, maybe they will support 5G. Okay, thank you, Emil. Uh, Paul, I'm going to come across to you because uh, you, I know you indicated in your earlier panel that another G might not be the most ideal situation for, for operators. Uh, no, it's, it's, it, 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 it's not. Um, I, I, I have to say, I find it, I find it quite strange that, that, you know, the mobile industry is, it, you know, is stuck to this, you know, 10 year cycle of, of, of technology change. I mean, if you, you look at when it was first done and how many years ago that was, and, you know, look at a parallel industry, say that, you know, the IT industry about how things have changed since then. Um, it seems, it seems just a bit old and old fashioned that we, you know, we, we think in those generational changes. Um, the, also, the big, I think the big issue here is that, you know, look, what, look what's happening with, um, you know, 4G to 5G. You know, operators around the world are doing, you know, massive capital investment and deployment um, and then, you know, expecting the services to come along. Um, you know, that, that seems a, and a very inefficient way of, you know, deploying and de deploying a new technology. So, wouldn't it be much better that we, um, you know, we deployed the technology, you know, when there was a market demand? And so, what we ought to be heading for, I think, is a an approach where we have a you know a flexible infrastructure where we can deploy you know the right technology and the right bandwidth at the right time um, to meet a to meet a demand. Um, and, you know, that's as one approach. Now, I think we also need to be kind of clear about what we mean by, by generation. I mean, I mean, if it's just a marketing term that we're saying, you know, you know, you know buy the new, new, newest thing because it's, uh, you know, a, six, a 6G phone, then fine. Um, but we need to look at, so, you know, I suppose the key thing is the air interface. So we've got new radio now. So... You know what? What requirements are going to drive an evolution to new radio, uh, which is going to be backwardly compatible, hence not a generational change? And which requirements would demand that we develop a new, a new, new radio, which would not be backwardly compatible? And we need need to ensure that we're, you know, we're we're, we're actually quite careful about that. And if there is the need for a, you know, alternative radio that we do put that infrastructure in place to allow that smooth transition. Um, you know, networks are becoming softwareized. Let's, let's, let's adopt tech software, you know, development implementation to techniques from you know, the IT industry and not, 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 not carry on with this generational approach. Thank you, Paul. Well, maybe there's a case here, for, you know, there's a split, isn't there, between the, the air interface, all the spectrum work that ITU, ITU are, does um, and the other aspects of, of our mobile networks and and, and Misha, uh, you work at an early stage on technology that comes into eventually comes makes its way into our networks. But what what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, so, you know, it, just to underpin some of the messages, really, if it, it's, it is actually truly a marketing term, you know, the generations. Uh, in 3GPP and Etsy, for instance, never make reference to 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G. It always goes and releases, and even they are structured in a more continuous way. However, there's one, one item which really goes in larger steps, and that is spectrum, so related to regulation, government, and, of course, the uh, cross-border agreements when it comes to spectrum. So I think if we really, really want to decouple the marketing from the more continuous uh, evolution and of, of the technology, we, we really need to talk about how spectrum is being handled in each country and globally. Once we have cracked that, I think, you know, the, uh, the technology will evolve just as Paul wishes it to evolve, whilst also maintaining the marketing part, which I think is also important because it is kind of giving, I think, operators these very, very clear cycles on how and when to sell technology is also good for investors because there's a lot of a lot of certainty around when, what type of money is needed. So hopefully, you know, once we solve that spectrum issue, which I think is really a critical part, we can get the best of both worlds. Thank you, Misha. And, and spectrum policy is going to be a whole different uh, summit or, or or series of panels for us. Um, I might leave that to Ray. Uh, Jevan, let me come come to you for some uh, final thoughts on on this subject. Sure, uh, just a few points. First, uh, strictly speaking, we, it's not about having a new G or or being forced or uh, or, or mandated to have a new G. We, we should also be flexible in the sense of uh, an, uh, the traditional approach to these uh, to these generations. At the same time, it is uh, fine to prepare and position uh, for for the systems, let's say beyond 2030, based on the as as was well said, requirements and use cases and and drivers. Uh, it's fine to do that. And as we do that, the enablement and, genera and ger generational change in technologies together with order of magnitude change probably in requirements, they will also make things, they are supposed to make things easier. So a lot of the things that we may, we may wish today uh, in its, whether you call it evolution or paradigm change needs to be enabled in a in a in a in a, in a e easier way so in a way uh, the notion of 6g has been a bit either marketing or pragmatic let's say the timeline that uh, for example misha mentioned you know how th there is reference to the next generation in general without mentioning 6g let's say in itur for example there is work in 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 uh, 2030 and beyond so all this work is supposed to help that, but uh, but we do have to be flexible. And something that I think Paul also mentioned, we, we have to have systems. We are not going to wait for a requirement and then build design ground up, but we have to have systems which are flexible and forward looking enough to adapt to a lot of needs on Imagine today. So there is a totality of these uh, considerations and calling it the fact that I need a 6G is either, you know, a, a pragmatic one at, at, at best. But, uh, but we do respect generational change in technologies and, and requirements and making today's desires even um, more possible and feasible. Thanks, everybody, for, for those responses, because this leads us very nicely to the audience poll for this year's 6G Summit. One question for this week, we had five multiple choice answers, and the question we have been asking is nice and direct. Do we need another G? Is the nine to 10 year generational model no longer fit for purpose? And hopefully you can see the real time data on the screen here. Um, we've had a lot of responses in for this, I can tell you. Um, and it has been changing through the day, but out in front is yes, but not by as big a margin as it once was. Um, it does look there as if the, I'm not quite happy with the current situation vote has been split, um, depending on, you know, varying to varying degrees. Uh, very interesting. We're going to keep these polls open. So if you haven't voted yet, then please do so. Make your vote count. And we'll report back on the results in Telecom TV, somewhere in Telecom TV, um, in about a week's time. 
Right, back to our Q&A, because I'm conscious of the time. We're about 40 minutes into the program, but we still want to get more of your questions in. So over to you, Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. I, I love the way that the, uh, the the poll result actually changed in real time while we were looking at it there. I don't know if you noticed that, but people are voting as we talk, so that's great. Okay, so next question from our audience, and the question is, should 6G prioritise features that enable the wireless network operators to move away from increasingly becoming just providers of dumb pipes? And if so, what would those features be? So uh, maybe we can start uh, the answers to that question with our two uh, operator panelists. Uh, Javan, could we start with you on that? Sure. Uh, first of all, we don't expect that even today to be a so-called dumb pipe, there's a great deal in terms of end-to-end uh, -end value creation and delivery together with our partners. We understand that the operational models and also business models evolve and the number of players, the number of things we do, and sometimes uh, we, you know, it's a business to business to customer in many of the IoT applications, for example. So it is something that we have moved beyond already. And also looking into the next decade, it should also be viewed as such. There's all from of, 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 players and, uh, of, of players and at the same, uh, for, value creation and delivery mobile network operators in a converged world will have a great role but together with their partners and the partners are both from research design and standards to operation and equipment and and, and management so uh, uh, that, that we expect to evolve but we also are understand the new operational and business models in a disaggregated world. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Javan. And uh, um, Paul, what's your view on this? Obviously, uh, this uh, this question does seem to be coming from a, a little bit of a sort of uh, uh, confrontational point of view, I guess, uh, for, to the operators. So, so what's your view on what 6G might be able to dispel this view of the dumb pipe? Well, I think there's... Um... They, I think that would, you know, it's a good, good answer, actually, in that, you know, must recognize that, most, you know, operators like ourselves, um, you know, currently offer solutions to, you know, in the, in, in the enterprise market. So, you know, that our, our, our networks are only part of the, um, you know, the, uh, the revenue stream and solutions that, that, that we provide. But I suppose this is, this is really driving at, can you, is there a way for operators to differentiate, um, you know, networks? Um, you know, between themselves and between, you know, you know, effectively raw internet um, usage. And I think, I think the answer to that is yes, there, 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 there is. Um, you know, the things that um, that I think, I, and, and that's really going to be driven, I think, by, you know, what a future market demand might be. You know, if you look at, um, you know, the private network. Uh, market at the, at the moment, you know, that's been driven by folks that want a new reliability, um, security, um, you know, privacy um, 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 of, a, you know, of, of, of their particular domain. And, you know, and, and operators are, you know, a really well placed to be able to deliver that, you know, on, you know, for example, on dedicated campus networks. But, you know, one thing that, that's in the future that we we um, you know, could be doing is by delivering that via our wide area networks. Okay, so you know, a slice on our wide area networks that provide that, you know, that that those SLA security, etc. So, I think that ability to slice the networks is 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 one one aspect. Um, the other, another aspect could be, for example, you know, if you look at um, you know open RAN architectures, then um, you know the RIC. The um, and resource intelligence controller, you know, those APIs onto there then give us, you know, the ability to, you know, put really quite sophisticated applications on there to, you know, optimize the network or, deli or deliver new deliver new services, and that that, that that's potentially a, a, an, another another thing that we can do as well. Um, 
so I think there's there, there's great opportunity, um, you know, beyond you know becoming be, beyond that um, becoming that dumb pipe. Um, clearly, big headwinds, but I think there's opportunities there for all operators to to to, to grab. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. And uh, Emily, you wanted to come in here as well. Does 6G offer any particular uh, ways for for the communication service providers to to be rich service providers and not just connectivity providers? So I think the question is really based on the fact that many attempts in the past have sort of not went so well when it comes to being uh, having a service for video streaming or having a service for video calls within their business directly and where over the top applications have succeeded much better. At the same time, I think we should remember that already 5G is trying to go away from this. So if we traditionally had like one system for TV broadcasting, one system for radio, uh, yeah, audio radio and one system for telephony and things like that, then right now we are in the, the era where everything is packetized. We are just sending data bits and we don't care about what it is. But already with the slicing and network slicing that was mentioned before, we try to go away from that so that operators will have the opportunity to sell differentiated services that are virtualized. So you, you can sell services of different kinds and then that can be utilized by businesses to build different application on top of it. Then it might not be the operators who actually build the end user applications because that is what really have failed in the past, but they can still provide different uh, the services for the application providers. Okay, great. Thanks, Emil. And uh, Arno, you wanted to come in on this as well. Yes, thanks. I, I think that uh, Emil pointed out a very valid point and uh, that's the scalability because uh, yes, the slicing enables also that we can use different kind of means. And this means really that uh, uh, one radio doesn't fit for all purposes. And, and that's very important to understand. We have ignored pretty much the discussions, for example, for extremely low power radios. So some people are talking about the zero energy radios. I don't believe in that because energy radio is anyways consuming some energy, you need to get it somewhere and we have the range. But if you don't need the data rate, you don't want to use that one. So we need to be able to also categorize radios and use cases such a way that that's very effective for the operators and for the users from the end user point of view. So that really means that 6G is not just a terahertz radio. It may be improvements there, there, and there. And the slicing approach will be enabling to use more flexible. We use 4G and 5G technologies whenever we can, but we can expand the 6G also towards the other use cases that are not so well covered with the existing radios. And that's really the beauty and opportunity for us in the softwareization and, and uh, other stuff and gives them opportunity also for the technologies and radio engineers to design the best radio for each use case. Okay. I, I think what, what's really exciting is that the potential is going to be there. It's whether how to what extent it can be braced by the communication service providers is going to be really interesting to watch. Okay, Guy, coming back over to you because time really has been flying by. And uh, I can see that the, uh, the, the red light might be start to flicker in the corner of the studio. So back over to you to what might be the final question. Let, well, it may be or we might get to it. Let's see what the responses are like, because this, this question has only just come in. Um, and and uh, I really like this question. Uh, let's see if anyone's up to answer and helping our viewer out with this question. Does the panel believe that the building blocks are in place with 5G and 5G advanced to enable a more evolutionary move towards 6G and less rip and replace of the network? Or does our current trajectory mean that in order to achieve some of these aspirational goals of 6G, we are going to be more invasive and we will need a lot more technology change? Misha. Right, so I, I think it's a great question. And uh, I believe we ask that question every time, you know, we design the generation. Really with 5G, we've done the groundwork, as we've said before. And uh, part 
of uh, the evolution is guaranteed now because we've softwareized a lot. So it's really, it, it's in a sense, you know, commoditized. Uh, you open it up as a platform. Anybody can really innovate on that. However, the bottlenecks are still on the on the core radio side and on the spectrum side. So we still need to do that homework and maybe in 6G we'll achieve that. Maybe we need until 7G really to reach that. What do I mean by that? So currently, for instance, you can't really virtualize everything which is happening on the radio side. You can't even visualize at the moment the kind of GPU operations, right? So the, the heavy graphic, graphic cards type of support for, let's say, if you want to play an Unreal Engine game uh, using an edge cloud computer, you can't really truly virtualize it very efficiently. So in the spectrum, we've talked about this before, it is still very much in the hand of the regulators, which happens in chunks of, you know, 10 years. Uh, Etc. So once we manage to softwareize uh, these elements, uh, I think that we're on a winning streak because everybody now can really innovate end to end, and this is where we will get true innovation happening in our telco system. And this is probably the first time we'll start talking about getting rid of that notion of these Gs. Oh, very exciting! Thank you, Misha, for that answer. And, and Arna, you'd like to come in on this one? Yeah, it's softwareization is nice thing. And uh, I hope that then the technologies and, for example, radios can offer a large enough portfolio that the people who are working in the networking and software can utilize them all efficiently with good awareness what will fit for each purpose. And then we are having a right balance. And I, I think that when we are taking something from previous generations and be more flexible of adapting different radios for different kind of uses, yes, we are getting there. So if the industry is ready for that, flexible enough. Yeah, we are having a new opportunities regarding that. Thank you, Arno. And over to Paul. Yeah, so just, um, you know, with it, in 5G, a bit late in the day, but, you know, DSS came along, which allowed, you know, operators to, you know, um, effectively more smoothly implement, um, 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 you know, 5G in, a, in, in the 4G networks. And, that, and that's kind of what we need, I think, whether it's in 5G, the evolution of 5G or, you know, Features when we first get to 6G, um, uh, don't mind, but it, you know, ideally part of evolution of 5G, kind of a, you know, DSS on steroids. So, you know, a, 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 a way that enable us to implement, you know, the right radio technology in the right spectrum at the right time on market demand. And, you know, I think, I think if we can get that into, um, um, you know, a, a development and standardization process now, okay, then I think that'll, that, that'll be a real, real asset to the industry. And, you know, massively improve, um, you know, customer experience as well as we migrate um, from from one technology to another. Paul, thank you very much for, for those comments. Um, and I think that is probably a very good place for us to end because, as Ray says, we are well into overtime now and so we will get... Uh, reprimanded for that no doubt um, thank you all very much we are indeed out of time it's the end of the after show thank you all of you for joining us in this live program and to our audience for sending in their questions we got through as many as we could we did our very best um, but there were still some unanswered questions there so as we said we will incorporate them in a telecom tv editorial later so that brings this year's telecom tv summit on 6g research and innovation to a close but there's still more to come including ray the return of one of our favorites yeah absolutely guy we've got our open ran summit later this month and it is absolutely rammed with top level speakers and has already attracted record levels of registration. So don't miss that. And then in November, we have an AI and Automation Summit too, which I'm really looking forward to. Absolutely, me too. And we're delighted that our summits are generating so much interest in the community. We've got a lot to talk about on Open RAN. The agenda is live on the website. You can register now. Watch out for news and updates on Telecom TV. And Ray and I will see you again very soon. Goodbye for now. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience.